if to you after VBS you'll be singing that song for at least two days, you are welcome. <laughs> I have been singing this train's bound for glory for seems like a month now. And uh, good morning, everybody. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord and get to see all these kids come up here and worship God. Uh, it blessed my heart today. I'm so happy for those little ones and, and their work here in this program and, and putting on a wonderful show for you. Uh, today, I want to bring a special message. We've kind of been going in order through the Gospel of John, and I want to stop in John, and I want us to turn over uh, to Luke chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, I want you to open it up to Luke chapter 5. And uh, what I would like for us to do is... Um, you know, the, all week long, this whole VBS was about the strength that only God can provide. And I want you to know, man, that strength sometimes is needed more than others. And this last week was one of them. We worked 60-hour weeks with these kids, and he gave us the strength we needed to get through the week. And uh, most all of us have a regular job. And so we'd have to put in our normal 9 to 5, and then we'd come in here and and we'd put in several hours with these kids, and he gave us strength all week long to make it all the way through all of it. And, and so as we kind of get into this study, Peter surrenders his life. And I believe the reason that Peter surrendered his life, finally committed completely and entirely to the Lord Jesus, is because he found himself hard at work and finding out that his strength just wasn't good enough to get through just another day without the intervention of Christ. And so I want you to turn there and... And we've been, like I said, we've been studying the gospel according to John for the last several weeks. And, and today we're going to put that on hold for this special message. And so I want to give us a brief recap, though, because I think it kind of joins with today's lesson. I don't really even think we're out of order as far as the timeline goes in the Bible. And so a brief recap of the previous lessons would be in order. And so in our first couple of weeks of our study in John, we were introduced to a person by the name of Andrew. And he had a brother, and his brother's name was Simon. Some of you know him as Peter, Simon Peter. And Andrew was a, a disciple of John the Baptist originally. And that all changed the day that Andrew met Jesus. And, and so Andrew, he was standing there under the discipleship program of John the Baptist, and he was standing beside John, and one day the Messiah come walking down the road there to the Jordan River. And John the Baptist seen him, and he knew right away. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he'd been preaching nonstop to his disciples, repentance and baptism, because the King is coming, the Messiah is coming. And this moment was a big deal for Andrew because everything that they had been hearing about, all the preaching that they have gone under, all the lessons that John the Baptist had brought them through, all led to this one moment, the moment that they could actually step out and follow Jesus Christ. And when John the Baptist seen them, he instantly turned over these two disciples of his to Jesus Christ. And you know what, Andrew and John, it says that whenever they heard John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God, they instantly decided to follow him. They said, This is it. This is our chance to follow God. We don't have another chance like this. He's right here in front of us. Let's follow him, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And so when John heralded the Son of God, his followers, they, they, just, they just unquestionably began to follow the Messiah, and they, and they followed him all the way to the next town. And they asked him, they said, Jesus, wh where are you staying at? And so Jesus said, oh, I'm staying right over here. You know, you can come with me. And that night, Jesus began to build his case on why he's worthy of being followed. And that night was a big deal to John and Andrew. Such a big deal that the morning after, when the sun began to rise, I imagine they'd been up all night listening to Jesus make a case for why he is the Son of God, why he is the Messiah, why he's worthy to be followed. And you know what Andrew did like any good brother would do? He ran immediately to Simon Peter and told him, he said, I, he was Simon then, but he ran immediately to him. He goes, I found him. I found the Messiah. You've got to come meet this guy. He's incredible. He's amazing. The stuff that he says stirs me inside, and it, and it makes me want to change, and it makes me want to be better. And, and so he went and he found Peter, and Peter come, and, and Peter, he listened to his brother, and he said, all right, let's go meet the Christ. And whenever he got before Jesus, and, and, and Jesus said, thou art Simon, the son of John, and thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation Peter. And from this moment forward, Peter began to follow Christ in a limited capacity, though. He just kind of 
stayed near him and he kind of listened to a little bit of his teachings, but he, he wasn't sold out yet for Jesus. And, and, and so he just kind of remained in close proximity to Christ. And Peter found himself just blessed to have witnessed great things by the hand of Jesus. He had seen some miracles taking place and those miracles had not fully convinced Peter to surrender his life. And, and you know, I have a reason that I believe that Peter was apprehensive because one of the major miracles that are recorded in our text can be found in the fourth chapter of Luke. And it goes like this. And now he arose from the synagogue, talking about Jesus, and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. And he stood over her and he rebuked the fever. And it left her and immediately she arose and served them. And so what happened is Simon Peter's mother-in-law was ill. She was deathly ill. And I, I really want you to know that you single guys are like, well, why wouldn't, why wouldn't Simon Peter follow Christ? He just performed a miracle. He took a fever from this lady. He healed her with his miraculous hands. And I tell you single people, if you don't have a mother-in-law, you don't understand why Peter might have had a problem with the healing of her at that time. He might have been all right. I'm just kidding if I offended any mother-in-laws out there. But... Uh, that's not the real reason, but that was a miracle. And you think that that miracle of healing would be enough for Peter to just sell out for Christ and decide that moment, I'm going to follow him with everything that's in me. Because not only can he heal spiritually, but he has the power over bodies and to make bodies healthy. And you know, all kidding aside, Peter, he'd witnessed many miracles by the hands of Jesus. And there was something missing that kind of blocked his total surrender to the Lord. And I I really want you to look at this as an inductive message. I want you to look at it from the inside out and I'm wondering, you know, how maybe you can sit on the sideline and watch God perform so many miracles but never totally get involved. And I think what happened to Peter here might explain that situation to you. And so as we've opened our Bibles to Luke chapter 5, I'm going to read it to you. And so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake Genesaret. And saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. And then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down the nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that were taken that day. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. And so when they had uh, brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word, and I thank you for this scripture. God, I pray that you just help us to gather understanding of it, Lord, that it would mean something special in our life. I pray your blessing over it in Jesus' name. So it was until this moment that Christ had been walking methodically from town to town and neighborhood to neighborhood, specifically targeting local synagogues, right? He had been baptized by John the Baptist. He has gone into the wilderness and he has been tempted. And now he has begun his earthly ministry walking from village to village and from place to place. And it was there that he is performing great miracles and he is introducing fallen man to God one more time. This man had lost touch with who Jesus and who God the Father was. And so although his journey uh, was long and, and, and it was a windy path, I want you to know that, that through that windy path, that long journey, he began to gather a multitude of people, as our text says. And these people began to follow him because he was doing great things. And he was saying incredible stuff. And the crowds, they just began to grow larger and larger. And, and, and he inspired these crowds. And, you know, there's a lot of people that say stuff walking amongst the streets and you don't see anybody follow him. Most of the time you'll turn and walk the other way. But Jesus, he had a different effect on people. And dozens, if not hundreds of people began to gather behind him. And they wanted to see what next miracle he was going to perform. And they wanted to see what next great thing that he would say. And this crowd just began to get larger and larger. And as he got closer there in the bay, this crowd, it grew with curiosity. And the density of this people just pressed about, about him. And, and perhaps even crushing him a little bit. And uh, 
This crowd, they just, it just kept, continued to grow larger and larger for one major purpose, and that was to hear the Word of God. And, and Jesus, as he began to get crowded in, and his voice was probably beginning to get overpowered with the people in the crowd talking and, and all the grumbling, and as people started pushing on him, they started backing him up there in the beach of that Genezaret Lake. And, and if, as I think about Jesus and where he's at here, pressed up against this beach, have any of you ever been to a concert before? And have you ever been closest to the lead vocals? Well, Jesus would be those lead vocals. And I can't help but imagine those people were just smashing in, trying to get closer and closer and closer to Jesus, to hear him, maybe to touch him, maybe to get close enough. And it started to squeeze in on them. And, and so Christ, he found a way to both preach the word of God and, and, and also not abandon these people. And he looked out on this bay and he seen these two boats there as they were standing out in the lake and they were anchored about. And I believe these boats, they were probably had an anchor and a rope pulled off of them and they were thrown into the shallow water and, and the, and the uh, boats were prepared for their next voyage. And Jesus is like, you know what? If I get in one of them boats, then I can get a little space between me and these people, but I don't have to abandon them right now because they all want something from me. And so uh, I do not believe anything in the life of Jesus Christ to be accidental or coincidental by any means. I believe that the entire walk of Jesus' life on earth was deliberate and it was well planned. And he was not aimlessly walking from town to town and he didn't just stumble in this temple or in that temple. And I, I don't believe that at this moment here he was at, just cornered by happenstance. I believe Christ targeted this specific beach and I believe he targeted that specific boat thousands of years before he ever stepped foot where he was at in that time. And, and Christ has a spectacular way of finding certain people despite the paths they are on and the businesses that they're involved in. He has a way of targeting. You ever been targeted by the Lord before? You ever been found somewhere unawares, not looking for God's presence, but God's presence just happens to find you? And I believe this was that moment for Peter. He'd been working all night. He'd been on them boats. He'd been fishing, and somehow Christ stumbled onto his boat. And so Jesus, he saw these two boats by the lake, and he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, the brother of Andrew from our introduction. And, and both boats happened to be empty of personnel when Jesus decided to enter one of them. And the fishermen, they had gone from them, and they were washing their nets. And so during this time before Jesus boarded the boats, uh, that boat had been toiling all night. They'd been out in the ocean, or out there in the bay, and, and they'd been fishing. It was better fishing at night. Everybody knew that. And so what you'd do is you'd fish all night long, and if you caught nothing or if you caught something, and you'd have to mend your nets. And so during the day, you'd take all the nets off of the boat and you'd gather on the beach and you'd begin to pull the trash out of those nets and you'd begin to repair those nets. And so uh, that's, that's what was going on. Peter, James, John, likely a few more deckhands were on the beach and they were fixing these nets as Christ decided that he would enter the boats. And Jesus had a 50-50 chance of picking Peter's boat. And I don't think he just picked a random boat. I think he knew which boat was Peter's. And I think he knew exactly where Peter was in his life. I think he knew Peter was just right on the verge of making a commitment, a full-blown, wholehearted commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I'm going to get in Peter's boat. And so Peter, he saw the Messiah enter his boat, and he quickly ran to him, and he entered the boat with him. And Jesus then asked him to put out a little from the land where he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. And it was common practice. Teachers would sit down as people would gather and they would teach while they were sitting. And so Jesus, he sat down in the boat to let them know that he's making himself comfortable, that he's planning on being with this crowd of people for just a little while longer. And I believe this settled the crowd for a moment. And I can't help but imagine the acoustics coming off of his voice, bouncing off of the water and hitting the multitude of crowds beyond there on the beach as they're listening for the voice to come that is supposed to be the voice of God. And, and that's very important to understand is why Jesus got in the boat is I believe he wanted to not leave them, but he also wanted the people in the back to hear what he had to say. And so I also believe that that, the, that, that Jesus, whenever he entered that boat, that, that everybody began to sit down also saying that I'm going to stay a little while and I'm going to listen a little while. And finally, the goal, I believe, that Jesus, of uh, Jesus' deliberate selection of this vessel was to get Peter away from his job just long enough to have him to hear Jesus speak. Remember, he'd been toiling all night on the boat and now he's mending nets. And Jesus says, you were distracted. And so I'm going to get in your boat and you're going to have no choice but to join me and push me out into the sea so that I can have you one-on-one -on -one and I can speak to you. And so the next point that I have 
in our lesson as the Lord targets Simon's business. And so our scripture begins in verse 4. It says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were breaking. And so they signaled to their partners and the other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both the boats so that they began to seek. So it was under this moment that some would argue that Christ's attention had been on the multitudes. But I want to argue, see, Christ is a multitasker. He was preaching to a crowd, kind of like a church service. When I'm up here and I'm reading the Word of God, I'm preaching to a crowd. But sometimes one of you gets singled out in that lesson. And that's what Christ is able to do here. Yeah, it may be looking like he's preaching to the multitudes there on the bank. But really, Simon is there and he's captive and he has nowhere to go and he's forced to listen as he plays the deckhand for Jesus. And I believe that Jesus was simultaneously speaking to everyone on that shore, but also preparing the heart for Simon for the next amazing event to take place. And so the scripture says that when Jesus had stopped speaking to the pushy crowd, he turned and he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon responded almost rhetorically, almost sarcastically, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Basically saying, there's no fish out there. We've already checked it. We've already let down our nets. We've been out there for hours and we've caught nothing. But you know what? Like a good servant, he entered a discipleship program with Christ. He didn't argue no further. He said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when Simon decided to follow Jesus as his master, as our text describes him, he did not sign up for a mentorship of being a great fisherman. He only sought to follow Jesus for his spiritual insight and spiritual direction. So he's like... Who's this carpenter that's going to tell me how to fish, right? Aren't you the son of Joseph? Who are you to tell me how to fish? You grew up way inland. I haven't seen you my whole life down here at the docks. I haven't seen you working with any nets. I haven't seen you participate in any kind of fishing. And so that word master there, epistoses, which can be translated to mean chief or commander. And so he gave him uh, uh, a name and a title. And it was one of respect, but it was a title that is set apart from who you would call God. It was just something like a chief, like a captain, right? And, and Christ deserves a title that's much higher than that and much further than that. There are many commanders, there are many chiefs, but there's only one God. And so Peter's response just called him master, you know, just teacher, but not Lord. And I can't help but wonder if I hadn't fallen into that category before when God asked me to perform some special duty around this church or in my family or in my personal life, I'm like master. I'll do it because your word says to do it, but I'm not like God, you are right. I should sell out for this task. And, and so I look at Peter and his apprehensive response, and I see his, his willing to obey, but his heart's not fully committed. And, and so he just calls him by a very limp-wristed name, chief or commander. Who's this carpenter who commands us to launch out into the deep? Who is this person who is the son of Joseph, who is a long line of carpenters, coming out here to tell us men who have toiled all night and we've caught nothing. We're real fishermen. We know what we're doing. We don't need your help, Jesus. We don't need you to tell us how to fish, but we're going to do it anyway because you're our master and you've told us to do so. And so, nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down my net. My net. And so I'm encouraged by Peter's obedience for sure. You know, sometimes that's the monotony of being a Christian. You do because God's asked you to do it. Maybe your heart's not 100%. But I am encouraged that Peter was obedient because he took his discipleship program to the Lord very seriously. And this is where I believe the Lord had him. By his simple act of obedience, this is where the Lord targets Simon's belief. My third and final point. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were breaking. And so they signaled to their partners on the boats and the other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll, call, you'll catch men. And so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and they followed him. And so Peter's obedience to Jesus commands results and nothing short of a miracle. Because he listened to Christ, the results were absolutely unbelievable. Caught more fish than you can imagine. 
When they had done what Jesus had said, they caught such a great number of fish that the nets began to break and that the boats began to sink. And I can only imagine as I picture these fishermen just the night before fishing all night long, working hard, throwing nets into the deep, trying all their secret spots, trying all their best tricks, putting on all their best tackle. And all they did was pull up empty nets and empty hopes. Nets full of trash and nothing worthy of consumption or sale. And they just felt like it was a bad day out on the water. In their power and in their knowledge, they are so-called commercial fishermen, right? That's their job. That's what they do for a, living, uh, for a living. And all night long, they worked tirelessly and they turned up empty-handed. But now a carpenter, born inland, likely never fished before, has presumed himself to be the authority on Peter's boat. He picks a very unorthodox approach of fishing, Jesus does. I want you to know that's what God does. He doesn't really want us to do things the way we're used to doing them necessarily. He doesn't always want us to do things the way the world is used to doing things. And so that's why Christ said, we're going to let down the nets in the middle of the day. Even though that's not when it's good fishing. And we're going to go out into the deep and we're going to pull them up and we're going to see what happens. And, and I believe that he did this by sh to show to Peter how powerful he was. His omniscience and his all-knowing of, of everything under the ocean and in the ocean. He knew exactly where to go. He knew exactly when to let down the nets to catch such a bounty that just blew their minds completely. I can't imagine how Peter felt seeing this as the nets began to tighten like a guitar string, and they began to unravel, and they began to burst. As that net started coming up out of the water, he can just start seeing the multitudes of fish starting to slap and crush the water. You know he expected to see that net to come up empty. You know he did. He did not trust Jesus to perform a great providing miracle for him in that moment because he argued with him a little bit on the nose end. And then that net starts coming up, and he realized that, that, that their haul is so great that they had to signal to their partners. They say, hey, guys, I need your help. We have so many fish, we're going to sink. I need you to come help me. Surely this has never happened in their careers before where it took two boats to haul one net. These boats were built to haul one net all on their own. And so he had to call his buddies out, his partners. And, and panicked by the success, they came and they filled both boats up. And heavy with the new payload of fish, they began to sink in the water. Boats began to sink heavy in the water in the middle of the day. The multitudes are looking on. They can't even believe that these guys are fishing during the day. And they just so happen to pull out so many fish. And I want you to know, this, this is the crutch of our entire message right here. As I, as I get ready to move to a close, I want you to know, many preachers, they stop right here. They stop their message right here at this moment. And this, I believe, is not a good place to stop. Who wouldn't want the, the story to stop here, right? They, they listen to Jesus, and then all of a sudden, they have a boatload of fish. And so all you got to do is listen to Jesus, and you're going to be rich. Boy, I like that prosperity message, don't you? Just listen to Jesus. He'll fill your boat up. He'll fill your nets up. But I don't see this as a prosperity message. I believe the intent of this message is to show how Jesus has an amazing ability to reach even busy Peter where he's at, to stop him from what he's doing, get all of his attention, and use his career to change his heart forever. Through all the crowds of noise, through all the failures of business, through all the pride of life and self-performed success, Christ was able to target his heart where the root of his disconnect lied. He was still a part of his career more than he is a part of his discipleship with Christ. And so physically obeying God can be robot, robotic and sometimes it's even lifeless. And when it gets that way, I almost feel like it's pointless if we're not going to serve the Lord with all our heart. We're not going to sell out completely for what God wants us to do. Then I don't believe God's completely honored or glorified in that action and that's awfully tragic. Its results are pitiful in this case. And here's a sad picture of Peter responding to the Lord nearly sarcastically and obeying totally apprehensively. And, and, and then you look at the result when the Lord performs through his total spiritual apathy. So it says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. That means he bent his knees. He fell prostrate before Jesus Christ. And he forgot about the fish. And he forgot about the success, and he forgot about the boat, and he forgot about the career. And he realized that his job become more important than just obeying Jesus. And he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I have not given you everything. 
I have not sold out to you completely. And, and the response to all success in life should be similar. There should be a falling of knees, a bowing before the Lord, and a cry of unworthiness. Unworthy because our trust falls short. Unworthy because our life does not suggest complete and total surrender. Unworthy because we are sinful and we do not deserve anything that the Lord provides. I want you to know, you might think you're pretty good at your career. You might think you're pretty good at your business or your job or whatever it is that you do. But I know if you take that same person and you put them somewhere like Uganda, and there ain't no career field, then what good are you there? We are blessed to be in the shoes that we're in, in a country that provides the kind of work that it provides and gives us the kind of situations where we can be really successful. And that glory is not because of your beautiful brains. That glory is because of an intervention of God, His mighty hands from heaven doing a work in your personal life. And our knees should shake at the sound of his voice and should bend every time he speaks and waiting for him to perform a miracle before we do so is not acceptable neither. He is worthy long before he gives us a great sign. He is worthy well before he provides for our needs. He is always worthy even before he began our creation. He was worthy. When you Christian fall in worship and repentance at the feet of Jesus, others will follow you. When Peter gave Christ the glory, his partners, James and Johns, they did the same thing. They fell too. And their entire worldly system of success was broken and replaced with broken men in God's provision. And no longer were these men spectacular professional fishermen. They were humbled by the voice of Christ and they fell down prostrate before him. And, and their brokenness of them was similar to the brokenness of their nets. They felt like they just couldn't hold back anymore, like the fish couldn't be held back anymore in those nets. And they just fell in their boats, and they fell before the Lord, and they just repented. And they asked Him for His forgiveness. And they said, Lord, we're going to sell out for you. I want you to know that as I close, I want to ask our music leaders to come and prepare a song of invitation. I want to bring the most encouraging part of this entire story it's not the boatload of fish. It's not the success story that people speak about today in their prosperity messages. The one of a time moment when men obeyed God and they caught an innumerable amount of fish. That's not the success story here. That's not the emphasis of the story that he just simply filled their nets with success and money. Then in one trip and in one cast, they broke every record ever recorded. This is not a my net runneth over kind of story. Jesus said, do not be afraid for now on you will catch men. And so when they had brought their boats to, to land, they forsook all and they followed him. These men, humbled by the love, the leadership and the life of Christ, they forsook all and followed him. They left their boatload of cash behind them. They took these boats to shore, loaded down with fish. This is equal to currency in their life and they left it. They left the fame of being the greatest fishermen of all time. They left their ambitions, their dreams, their aspirations, their comforts, their skills, their careers, and they even left their livelihoods. That's how they fed themselves. That's how they supported their households and their families, to follow some dusty old carpenter who had the words of God. He said, do not be afraid, for now on you'll catch men as he comforted them. And if your if you're faithful obedience to me is what Christ said, and if you put your complete trust in me, then I will fill those nets not with fish that die, but I'll fill them with souls of men that will live forever. I thank God that Peter followed him and become a fisher of men because I stand here today because of this book and his work putting it together. And that's what the Great Commission is all about. That's what our whole VBS program was all about. We were fishing for men and women, future men and women. And, and these kids coming in this place and gathering under this cross and under these songs of worship and under this word, I pray that one of them might have been a trap Peter in a boat who decided that none of it is worth it unless I follow Jesus. That's the only place that I can find joy and satisfaction and comfort in my life and where my soul can be at peace is if I fully sell out and commit myself to the feet of Christ. And so he says, do not be afraid. I will not reject the humble knees of a repentant Christian. In fact, I'll lead you all the way. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this scripture and I thank you for the testimony of Peter. I pray, God, that you'd help us to fully give ourselves to you, Lord. Let us not reserve ourselves in any way.
would turn over all of our ambitions to you and all of our passions would be in your direction and in your church and in your Bible. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to come down here and rededicate yourself or if you want to join the church or if you want to pray, you want to ask me about salvation, I'm going to stand right here. And this is going to be a time I'm going to give you an opportunity to that. Can you please stand?